in your mind, what is the greatest threat to national security? Well, I would say that as we look at the time horizon associated with threats, the greatest immediate threat to the United States and to the world is the threat posed by the rogue regime in North Korea and his continued efforts to develop a long-range nuclear capability. And so it's immensely important that we work together with, with all of our allies, partners, everyone internationally uh, to convince Kim Jong-un that the continued pursuit of these capabilities is a dead end uh, for him and his regime. So let me get a little specific on North Korea. We're being told that the ICBM, the most recent launch, broke up on re-entry. Is North Korea having trouble on that re-entry step, and thereby right now the U.S. overall is not at threat from their ballistic missiles? Well, it'll take some time to assess each of these missile launches, but what is clear is that every time Every time he conducts a missile launch and nuclear test, he gets better. And, and whether it's a success or failure isn't as important as understanding that over the years, he's been learning from failures, improving, and thereby increasing his threat to all, to all of us. So has the potential of war with North Korea increased since this latest launch? I think it's increasing every day, which means that we're in a race, really. We're in a race to be able to, to solve this problem, not just us, right, but the United States, all of our allies and partners, as we know, China has tremendous coercive economic power over North, North Korea. I mean, you can't, can't shoot a missile without fuel, right? And, and so there are, there are ways to, to, to address this problem uh, short, short of armed conflict, but it, it, it is a race because he's getting closer and closer. And, um, and there's not much time left. So is China serious about averting this conflict? I mean, are they slow walking this? Well, you know, the initial indications were very positive. The president, as you know, very early in his presidency, met with President Xi in Mar-a-Lago. And there were some very significant results from that initial discussion about, about North Korea that I think represented dramatic changes potentially in China's, not only their attitude toward the problem, uh, but, but also the actions that they could take. The first of these is that China agreed that this is a threat to everyone. This is a global threat. This is a threat to China. Remember in the past, the old language would be, well, this is really a problem between the, the United States and North Korea. The second, the second big change is that China was wholly committed, and President Xi affirmed this again during President Trump's recent visit to Beijing, is that China is committed to the complete denuclearization of North, of North Korea. And remember in the past, and still sometimes even today, you see it lapse back into, into the language of freeze for freeze or suspension for suspension. That's not the objective. Negotiations, for negotiation's sake, not the objective. The objective is denuclearization. And that's a, that's a big shift as well. And the third big shift is China recognizes that it does have tremendous coercive economic power uh, over North Korea. So we're asking China not to do us or anybody a favor. We're, we're asking China uh, to, to act in, their, in China's interest, as they should. And we, we believe increasingly that it's in China's urgent interests to, to do more, to do more even beyond UN Security Council resolutions. As we know, we cannot rely on, the, on an international body because there are those within that body who obstruct that important work. For example, I mean, Russia just vetoed the joint investigative mechanism for use of chemical weapons in Syria to, to provide more cover for the Assad regime to potentially commit further mass murder. Uh, we know that, that, uh, that getting the sanctions that we need 100 percent cut off, I think, would be appropriate at this point. The president believes that, uh, of, of, uh, of oil and fuel to, to North Korea may be impossible from a U.N. Security Council resolution. But that doesn't constrain China or any other nation from taking the bilateral actions that they can take above and beyond that. Well, China just sent an envoy to North Korea. Does that mean that that envoy failed, that they had this launch? Well, as you know, Kim, Kim Jong-un isn't particularly cordial to anyone, right, and said to even, even his own people. And so I don't think it, it came as a surprise to, to Chinese leadership that, that this envoy was rejected and, and, and was not, uh, didn't even... Uh, didn't even have a meeting uh, with, uh, with, with uh, Kim Jong-un. And so 
uh, you know, the prospects now for, for any dramatic change in his behavior without, without some significant new actions in the form of, uh, of much more severe sanctions, complete enforcement of the sanctions that are, that are in place now, um, I think it's extremely unlikely for us to, he's not going to have a, a Grinch moment, I don't think, with his heart grows his two sizes larger and we see him change his, uh, change his behavior. I didn't think we were going to get a Grinch reference. That's pretty good. <laughs> this close to Christmas. Uh, a couple more things about North Korea, and we'll move around the world, uh, if you would. Understanding that diplomacy is the preference here, obviously. Understanding that there are many military plans and options, there always, always are, for North Korea. Is there any military option that does not include the death of tens of thousands of South Koreans? Well. Well, we know for sure that this is what, this is what Kim Jong-un has done, right, since, since 1950, right, is, is, is uh, held that the population of, of South Korea hostage, right? Every, every, every provocation, uh, every, uh, every hostile act has originated uh, from the North. He has, in, in the past, be, be able to, been able to do that, obviously, with, with large conventional capability, all these artillery pieces and rockets and so forth that exists not too far uh, north of Seoul. Hundreds of them. So, right, thousands of, of, of munitions and so forth. And so there's no military course of action that's, that, that comes without, without risk. And that's why uh, our alliance with South Korea, with Japan, th those alliances are stronger than ever. What Kim Jong-un is doing is driving us closer and closer together and, 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 and coalescing the international community against Kim Jong-un. If you think about what's happened just in recent months, and I think there, this ought to be something maybe we ought to provide a roll-up of, but, but countries across the globe have taken action beyond UN Security Council resolutions. First of all, South Korea and, and Japan are improving their defense capabilities at breakneck speed, and they're doing that in, in, in uh, cooperation with us. We're doing that through joint bilateral most exercises and, and uh, multilateral exercises uh, in Korea and elsewhere, but also we're doing it with, uh, with improved defense capabilities. But what's been striking, I think, is how many nations have expelled North Korean diplomats who have ceased all economic relations with North Korea. This is from the, the Philippines to Thailand to Vietnam to Sudan to Brazil to Mexico. I mean, so many examples of countries who are acting beyond the UN Security Council resolutions and, and supporting uh, all of our efforts to, to convince Kim Jong-un that this, this is a dead end, diplomatically and economically. 